All right, well, uh, kind of hard to follow up a little baby great white shark, but uh, we're going to talk about snakes. Um, so uh, I'm John Vanek. Um, I grew up on Long Island. I went to Walt Whitman High School, uh, and then I did my undergraduate in uh, wildlife biology up at SUNY ESF in Syracuse. Um, kind of moved around the country, um, taking jobs that pay like $6 an hour, uh, studying salamanders and uh, black bears actually pay less than salamanders. Um, then I came back here to do a, a master's and take on more debt at Hofstra. Um, <laughs> but it was worth it because I got to study what is objectively the best snake, which is the eastern hognose snake. Um, this is, they're just an amazing snake. So uh, really the goal of my talk is going to be to introduce you to this awesome animal and uh, kind of show you how scientists and wildlife biologists kind of go about learning more about the natural history and ecology, these really, really cool things. Um, all right. Um, so we're going to start off with this quote. Uh, At least one generation of Long Islanders has matured that does not know what a puff adder is. So we're going to look at all the common names of the eastern hognose snake. And if you talk to any old timer uh, or anyone who lives in a rural area outside of Long Island, they're going to refer to the eastern hognose snake as a puff adder. Uh, and we'll see why in a little bit. But just keep this quote in mind, and it's kind of depressing, right? Uh, how many of you, raise your hand, have ever seen a wild eastern hognose snake? All right, never mind. Um, <laughs> how many? Wow, all right. I guess this is a, a selective audience, right? OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the name of the eastern hognose snake, because it's kind of interesting. We'll talk about what it looks like, what makes a hognose snake a hognose snake, uh, what they do, which is the best part of a hognose snake, um, where they occur in the country, and then we'll talk specifically about Long Island um, and what we're doing with hognose snakes here, what we've done in the past. Um, my master's thesis defense was an hour and 20 minutes, so I will not keep you that long, or I'll try my best. I think Tim will do a better job of cutting me off than Russ did. Um, all right, and so this talk is brought to you by Rubus, how many people love Rubus when you're not eating it? All right, we also had a lot of Smilax, and we also had a lot of poison ivy. Uh, so all of these things have uh, permanently scarred my arms and legs in the process of researching this snake, uh, but it was worth it, because they're awesome. So what is an eastern hognose snake, and why do we call them that? So if we look at the scientific name, heterodon, it means different tooth. Right? And so that refers to these right here. These are rear fangs. Um, so the eastern hognose snake is not traditionally venomous. What it does have is teeth in the very back of its mouth that inject a saliva that predominantly affects amphibians. So scientists used to do really cool things back in the 60s when you didn't have to worry about ethics. Right? Um, so what scientists did was they took the saliva of a hognose snake and they put it into a mouse with a needle. And you know what it does? Nothing. If you put that into a toad, that toad turns red, swells up, and dies. So um, people often ask, well, these guys have fangs. Are they venomous? Well, first, you'd have to stick your finger all the way into the back of its mouth to reach those fangs. And second of all, unless you're highly allergic for some strange reason, you're fine. So that's heterodon. That's the genus, right? Um, platyrinos. That means flat nose. And that refers to this modified rostral scale, which is awesome and what allows eastern hognose snakes to do a lot of the cool things that they do. Um, so basically, it's shaped like a spade. And that allows the eastern hognose snake to dig its own burrows. Most snakes actually cannot dig a hole if they wanted to, because um, they don't have hands, right? Um, but the eastern hognose snake has a shovel on its face. Um, and that, that allows them to basically lay their eggs where other snakes cannot because they can dig a hole like a turtle. Super cool. All right. And then so people have really weird names for this snake. They call them the spreading adder, the spitting adder, the sand adder, the puff adder. And then we have the eastern hognose snake, which is the name I prefer, although technically the official common name is the eastern hog-nosed snake. I prefer eastern hognose snake, and we saw why. That upturned nose like a, like a pig. Um, I don't know where they get this name adder. They do spread their neck out like a cobra. That makes sense. They do live in sandy areas. That makes sense. They do puff up and swell up. 
And they do, they don't spit saliva, but they do the same way a cat spits, right? They kind of like make that weird noise and they kind of lunge at you a little bit. I don't know where the adder part came from, um, but it's very common. So eastern hognose snakes are one of the coolest snakes because not only those things we just looked at, which are awesome in their own, their own right, um, it's just a beautiful animal, right? So if you look at it, eastern hognose snakes don't have stripes. What they have are blotches along the back. They also have this, this line that runs through their eye and across their forehead and across to the other eye. And so those blotches with that, that eye stripe is one of the great ways to tell a hognose snake if you're not looking at its hog nose. What's also amazing about eastern hognose snakes is they're actually one of the most variable colored snakes in the United States. Um, so they occur in all sorts of colors, like this beautiful um, kind of bronze and black color. You can have these spectacular orange and whites and, and kind of reds with that yellow on the face there. But you always see dark blotches and you see that stripe across the face, right? They also come in a beautiful red color. Um, they can be kind of very pale and brown and just uh, kind of gray with that red hint. Absolutely stunning. And then they even come in a completely jet black morph. And in some areas, the jet black morph is actually the most common morph. Um, no one understands the genetics that go into these different color phases, and uh, it's not even quite clear if it's recessive or dominant. What is really cool about the black snakes is that they start off like this, and then every time they shed their skin, they get darker, 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 darker until they're this color. Amazing, right? And so remember that color polymorphism, and we'll come back to that in a little bit, and that's another part of the cool story about Long Island. So behavior. This is what makes eastern hognose snakes truly spectacular, and it's why every single person who's met one that didn't kill it loves it. So the first thing that you'll notice with an eastern hognose snake is they spread their neck out like a cobra, and they do that by spreading out the ribs in their neck. It's really cool, and what it does is it makes the snake look bigger. Um, and that's used to scare away predators. Now, the second thing that they do, which is truly amazing, is they play dead, and they do it really well. Um, I always thought they should really be called the possum snake and not the, not the eastern hognose snake. Um, so we're going to watch this short little video, um, and it's just, it's really cool. This is a snake I was studying for part of my master's. Can you hear hissing? Most snakes actually can't hiss, but eastern hognose snakes can. They also almost never bite. I don't actually know anyone who's been bitten by an eastern hognose snake that wasn't purposely sticking their finger in their mouth. So you can see she's not doing anything to me. So she's going to writhe around, flip her, her belly up, um, she's going to open her mouth, she's going to stick her tongue out, and uh, she is playing dead. No one knows why they do this, because this doesn't seem like a very adaptive thing. Um, but what's really cool is all the hognose snakes do this. There's three or four species, depending on who you talk to, and all of them do this. So it's an ancient behavior. And the coolest part is what happens when you try to flip them over. <laughs> no, they, so this is always, they'll always come back up and, uh, and be alive. And so even when they're playing dead, they will not bite you. They want you to really think they're dead. Right? No, you're not dead. It's okay. Oh, I guess you are. You can even touch their tongue while they do this. You ever touched a snake tongue before? All right. So this snake is uh, 
a really cool snake that I had a lot of fun with. Um, so she actually wound up laying about 30 eggs and uh, she's a really cool snake. Now let's talk about kind of uh, how they make their living, right, the ecology. So most people understand that eastern hognose snakes eat toads, especially if you're sitting in the audience here, right? Uh, toads are their favorite food. And they also, they benefit from that upturned nose because they'll actually dig toads out of the sand because eastern hognose snakes are diurnal but toads are nocturnal for the most part. So what you'll do is, you'll, uh, what they'll do is you'll see them kind of crawling around and stop, sniff the soil, and then just dig a hole, find a toad that's sleeping, and eat it. Uh, it's not very pleasant for the toad, because uh, if you remember what I told you about their venom, it basically turns them red, and they swell up, and then they die. And then they eat them. Um, so an interesting part of the puzzle is, on Long Island, we only have the Fowler's toad. We don't have the American toad, which occupies the rest of New York State. Um, so hognose snakes on Long Island only live where we have toads, because that's their number one food. Um, they'll eat other things, but toads are the bulk of their diet everywhere they've been studied. And by that, I mean everywhere a scientist back in the 50s or 60s found a dead one, cut it open, and looked in its stomach, and there was a toad in there. Um, they will eat other things, though. They will even eat super toxic newts. Um, almost no animals can actually eat these newts, right? But a, a really cool paper just came out that showed that these, these snakes not only can handle the toxins in the newt, but they can actually pass that, that immunity down. Um, so really cool organisms, and just they do cool things. So we heard they were called sand adders, right? So why are they called sand adders? Well. Eastern hognose snakes are not limited to sandy areas, but they appear to be most common in sandy areas, right? So Long Island and the rest of the coastal plain has always been kind of uh, a stronghold for the eastern hognose snake historically. Um, and you can see this snake here. It doesn't really have great camouflage, but the second it moves into those bushes, you're not going to see it, right? Um, so they mostly prefer to live in sandy areas, and one of the reasons might be going back to their name, the eastern hognose snake, right? So remember, they can dig their own burrows. So if you can dig your own burrow and you live in a sandy area, that means you don't have to find a really good spot to lay your eggs. You can, you can lay it where you want to lay it for the most part, right? You're not limited to finding a log or uh, a rock pile, right? So it's kind of interesting. Um, and so you can see here, this is a nest I excavated. Um, there's 39 eggs here. Um, the female that laid this nest was 600 grams, and this clutch weighed about 300 grams. So she, she pumped out about half of her body weight in eggs. Um, and this, you can't really see from the scale, but this is about uh, almost a foot down into the soil that she dug. And it took her two days to dig this hole. So I sat out there in the afternoon and watched her dig this over two days. Um, and then I covered it back up, and right before they were about to hatch, which is about 59 days, um, I went back out and I put a little cage over it and I got all the babies out so something couldn't eat them. And uh, we brought them to a nature center and lots of little kids got to see their first eastern hognose snake fresh out of the egg and then we released them into the wild and it was, it was pretty awesome. However, eastern hognose snakes don't only live in areas that are sandy. They also live in hilly woodsides, uh, rocky hillsides. Um, and so they're much harder to spot when they're not out on the open sand. So you can actually see this snake right here. And this is that snake from the video, actually. So this isn't really what we think of as eastern hognose snake habitat on Long Island, right? But look at that slope. That's pretty intense. This is actually a slope that leads up to the Adirondacks. Um, up here is an Adirondack ridge. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. All right, and before we transition over to Long Island, we'll just kind of review the hognose snake in context, okay? So they have a really broad geographic distribution, right? They don't actually go all the way up here, but on, they're here in Ontario. But this is a simple, a simple map. Um, but you can see they range all down the coastal plain up to Texas, and basically they stop at the Great Plains, right? Um, this whole area is, is not too sandy. The coastal plain is sandy. Up here is sandy. Um, so it's actually pretty interesting what they're doing here. Um, we're not really quite sure. Um, but on Long Island, uh, in New York, they have a, an interesting range, right? So it's a disjunct range, right? So they occur in three main 
subpopulations. There's this group up here. This is the Saratoga Sand Plains, right? So that's um, just north of Albany, starting at the Albany Pine Bush and going, going up. And uh, it's this weird, this weird distribution, but this is where they occur. Um, then there's this, this lower Hudson Valley region and that kind of going into the Valley and Ridge. Um, and then we have Long Island, right? So how are eastern hognosnakes doing on Long Island? Going to look into that a little bit. So this is a super cool paper that came out uh, in 1915 in this journal called Copia. Um, and Copia is a journal that publishes stuff on fish, amphibians, and reptiles. Um, and it was initially created by a Long Islander, Nichols, right? So the Nichols estate, this guy helped create Copia. And so there was a paper in it called uh, Long Island Snakes. And I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but I will read you this little excerpt. Um, and it's just, it's, it, it's illuminating to me, and it's just amazing. So, on several occasions during July and August 1908, the young of the hognose snakes were encountered in amazing numbers along the dunes at Rockaway Beach. You guys ever seen a hognose snake at Rockaway? I don't think so, right? And their tracks made a hieroglyphic network among the smooth sand. So not only were there a lot of hognose snakes, there were so many that the sand looked like hieroglyphics. Uh, a party of campers on the beach had captured a hundred or more young hognoses and had placed them in a barrel of water from the notion that they belonged to an aquatic species. Most of the young snakes were drowned. Um, I think the only way you can approach this is to find humor in that situation. I just think that's kind of, it's sad, but it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so historically, Long Island was known for eastern hognose snakes. People would go out to the Hempstead Plains uh, sure. So only the spotted form of this species has been observed on the beaches, but the black form is not uncommon in the wooded regions around Jamaica. Uh, Mr. Davis has a specimen which was of uniform slate color collected at Yapank. Um, the hognose snake seems to be abundant along the south coast of Long Island all the way to Montauk Point. Several were seen at the Promised Land. Um, so people would, would go to the Hempstead Plains, they take the train out, and they would collect so many hognose snakes that it was profitable and they would take them back and basically dry them and put them on a stick and sell them in New York City as uh, snake on a stick. Um, super common. Uh, you could find them everywhere. If you look at the museum records, they were found on Long Beach, they were found at Breezy Point and Rockaway, they were found in Queens, in, uh, I, I'm sorry, in uh, Brooklyn and Queens and Nassau and all over Suffolk, North and South Forks, all along these islands. Really common snake, almost the quintessential Long Island snake. And so now we're gonna, we're gonna look at another older article. So they were super common in 1915, but by 1963, um, we look at that quote again. So that quote I quoted was not a quote from today when we think of traditional biodiversity loss. That quote about how at least one generation of Long Islanders has matured that does not know what a puff adder is, that was from 1963. And when you think about the implication of what he's saying is, He's not writing in a herpetology journal. He's writing in the Long Island Forum. So what this is saying was, at least a generation ago, everyone knew what a puff adder was, right? Not just people who liked lizards and snakes. Everyone knew what a puff adder was. And, but that was before the internet, right? So uh, they were super common, and they were the Long Island snake. He continues on to say that, they have always been most prolific on the Long Island beaches and freshwater swamplands. I have found them on Coney Island, the Rockaway beaches, Jones Beach, Fire Island, and at Babylon, Merrick, Smithtown, Mattituck, and Huntington. Now the only spot which I receive unquestionable identification is Lake Grove. I don't think they're really in Lake Grove anymore, but, um, and they're certainly not in Babylon and Merrick and Smithtown, right? They're actually kind of close to Mattituck, but also not in Huntington. Uh, and then he kind of ends with this, this kind of interesting perspective from someone in the 60s in a, in a general audience publication that says, it seems incredible that in a single score of years, the puff adder's greatest enemy, man, has been able to come within an, acre, an ace of bringing about the snake's extermination on Long Island. That's kind of ahead of its time thinking for someone in the 60s. I think that's pretty cool for a snake. So this is what the range of the hognose on Long Island looks like today. Remember that map was entirely orange just a few slides ago. Um, 
They're considered by the DEC to be a species of special concern, so they're listed in New York, but they're not threatened or endangered, uh, which is a good thing, um, but it could be better, right? Um, and so they're also listed as a species of regional concern by the uh, Northeast Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Um, so this is definitely a species that should be on everyone's radar, and hopefully we can do something to conserve this awesome animal. Um, but so what is this area right here? That's where we are now, right? This is the, the Long Island Central Pine Barrens region. And this, is, this area, it's pretty well protected, right? We have BNL, we have Brookhaven State Park, we have a whole lot of protected areas. So hopefully this population should be good for a long time. There's scattered populations out at Peconic Dunes and out on the, on the dunes. Historically found at Montauk, not so much anymore for some reason. If you Google Eastern Hognose or just Hognose and Montauk, you don't find any pictures on Instagram or anything like that. So you'd think someone, we'd know if someone found one at Montauk. So many people go there. Um, I think this is quag, actually. Um, but they're pretty much gone from the rest of that range, which is sad. But it makes sense when you look at this map. So this is a map of impervious surfaces. So areas of red are pavement, right? Um, so you can see why we don't find them at Coney Island or the Rockaways um, or Long Beach uh, or Brooklyn or Queens. That makes sense, right? And as we go out east, we also see why their range has declined. You can actually kind of see the, uh, the little collider right here, right? Um, so what's this? This is um, Kinetquat, right? No one has found one in Kinetquat in quite a while. They might be there, but we're not sure. Um, we have Edgewood Preserve. There's kind of rumors that they might still be there. We haven't really seen them. Um, these little preserves in Nassau, unlikely, right? Um, I've spoken to the people at Comset and up on the North Shore, but I haven't heard anything about them being there. So for, for some reason, the snake is declining even in areas where we don't have an impervious surface problem, right? Um, now, what about Fire Island? Fire Island is a national seashore, right? And we saw that they used to be fairly abundant at Fire Island. Well, they stopped being fairly abundant, and no one's really quite sure why. Um, so much that the, uh, the federal government, by means of the National Park Service, hired an intern specifically to find a hognose snake on Fire Island. And um, he couldn't find one. And he spent a whole summer out there. Um, again, in 2010, uh, this report came out, uh, Herpetological Inventory of Fire Island National Seashore. They also could not find one, and they have some really darn good herpetologists looking. Um, there was a sighting that could be considered credible. Unfortunately, there was no picture, uh, and it was not able to be located. Um, so there might be some hanging on in some of the real wilderness areas. L literally, right? We actually have a literal wilderness area out there, which is kind of cool. Um, but no success so far. Um, there might be some future work looking for hognose snakes when we repeat this. Not we, I wasn't part of this, but when the federal government um, does another herp survey of Fire Island, hopefully we can, we can find some strongholds. Um, but now I'm just going to transition a little bit and just kind of show you um, some of the stuff that I did for my master's research on the eastern hognose snake in Long Island, or on Long Island. And, um, and I'll, instead of showing you a lot of results, I'm going to show you a lot of methods. So how a wildlife biologist goes about finding these really cool snakes and, uh, and what we do with them. And then a little tiny bit of results and then uh, if there's time for questions or if I'm zooming through this, we'll see. Um, so the first real research that was done on eastern hognose snakes in Long Island actually took place here. Um, some really great people um, worked with uh, Jeremy Feinberg. Um, I think you were here, right, Tim? Uh, and so some really great people said, let's, let's look for these hognose snakes at Brookhaven. Um, and, and they found some, and it was super cool. Um, and they were able even to put radio transmitters in them and really find out about what they're doing. Uh, this was in the middle 2000s. Some cool stuff, right? You see, oh, what is this thing? Right? That's pretty cool that these snakes are hanging around uh, these he pretty heavily modified areas. So there, there's some hope for these snakes, right? Um, and that, that was about it on Long Island. So there was a couple years of research going on there. It was super awesome. It actually got some publicity. Some of you might remember it. It was in Newsday, all that stuff. Um, and then in 2012, I came here to start my master's. Um, and fortunately, I was able to find a population of hognose snakes that was quite robust. Um, 
And in 2013, I was able to find 37 snakes. Um, that number went up to about 142 in 2014. And then I was able to find, um, by the time I finished last year, I, was, I had about 182 unique individual snakes that I had marked and released into the wild. Um, and so I'm, I feel extremely fortunate um, to have uh, been able to, to find this population. Um, and it's a pretty cool population, right? So they seem to be really small. And so I'll mention this in a bit, but um, we see that, so the, so the snout vent length, which is basically tip of the nose to where the snake poops, um, they're pretty small compared to snakes uh, in Arkansas and other parts of Long Island, Ontario, Massachusetts, Virginia, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Connecticut, uh, upstate New York, Michigan, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Georgia, right? So we have this population I located is, with help of others, of course, is, is pretty literally short. And that's interesting in its own right. And that actually wound up being um, the focus of my thesis was this, this dwarfism. Um, how many of you were here for that cool orchid and uh, saffrophyte talk yesterday? That was pretty sweet, right? Just like orchids and other cool rare plants, uh, people in the snake community, rare snakes, rare turtles. Um, unfortunately, we, we really don't feel comfortable divulging exact specific localities. Um, and, and I'm sure in this audience you guys understand because you're all conservation minded. Um, so we're not gonna talk exactly where my, my research was, but uh, rest assured the people who, who are in charge of conservation decisions, they know and so we're, we're working on this. So the second part of these little dwarf hognosnakes that we located is that they all look pretty much the same. Remember how we saw that there were red snakes and orange snakes and black snakes and pale gray snakes? These two snakes, who are, this is actually a male-female pair that I caught copulating, um, they look like all the other 182 that I found, every single one of them. Um, they all have this beautiful yellow belly and they all have this absolutely stunning sandy color. Every single one of the 182 of them. That's pretty cool. To a scientist, to me, that says reduced genetic diversity, right? Or adaptation, uh, or both. So um, that's something that we're hoping future graduate students at Hofstra might look into. Um, and just look how absolutely stunning these snakes are. How pretty are they, right? Look at that. Um, so I was able to look at a whole bunch of different things with this really unique and dense population of snakes. Um, we were able to look at their home range, their habitat use, their activity patterns. Um, how many males how, versus how many females? Um, is the population growing? Is it declining? How many are there? How many are there in a specific area? Um, so we were able to kind of take a snapshot of a couple of these different questions. And uh, so now I'm just gonna uh, show you kind of how we figure out one of those, which is home range. So the home range of an animal is not its territory. And most reptiles don't have territories. So a territory is something like those wolves we saw earlier have, right? They have an area that they actively defend. Snakes, for the most part, don't fight other snakes. Um, instead, what they have is a home range. So it's an area that they just, they use for breeding and reproduction and sleeping and uh, meeting all their life history needs. Um, so to elucidate home range, you first need to catch a snake. And there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, one, you can find a track in the sand, and you can follow that track and find a snake that way. Um, this worked for one of the 182 snakes that I found. <laughs> Not a very successful technique like it is with mammals. Um, and what's really cool though too, so these are, this was a herring gull that walked this way, and then this was a fox that walked this way. Uh, super cool. And hopefully you can't read my credit card number, but. Uh, alternatively, you could trap a snake. This is not a snake trap. This is a, a trap I found while I was doing my field research, and it made me feel very uncomfortable. Uh, I don't know who put it out there, what they were trying to catch. Um, yeah, I don't know. When you're out in the woods by yourself and you find this, you get a little nervous. Uh, however, there is a technique that actually works for trapping snakes, and that is basically a minnow trap on land, but it's modified. Um, so this is basically called a box trap, and it works the same way as a minnow trap. Big entrance, little exit, 
into a, a, a confined space, and then the snakes, because they're unfortunately not as smart as uh, many of the cool cetaceans we saw earlier today, uh, they can't find their way out of the little hole. And this was pretty successful. I caught about 50 snakes this way. And basically the way it works is a snake crawling along, hits this fence, says, well, I'm not going to go over the fence. Maybe I'll just crawl along it. And then they're funneled into the trap. And if you're super lucky, you come and check it in the morning and you open the door. Please don't uh, criticize my, my carpentry. Um, you get this amazing jewel when you open it, basking in the trap. <laughs> ah. um, gorgeous. Uh, another amazing sight, you can see it spreading that hood out. And you can notice they're all that beautiful color. They're all the same looking. Um, and you can see my uh, permit numbers scribbled with uh, crayon. But, uh... Now the reason you want to use a trap is because you could also just go looking for a snake. But when they're not sitting out in the sand, it's very hard to see them. So there's actually a snake in this picture. Can you see it? No, I can't either. Um, it's probably in this hole, but you still can't see it. And then uh, what I wound up actually doing was putting my cell phone in there and shined a, a flashlight. And you can kind of see it. See this pattern? It's brighter on my laptop, but uh, basically there's a little snake hiding in this hole. So if you weren't trapping that snake, you would not, you would not find that snake, correct? So assuming you caught your snake through trapping or getting lucky and seeing it out in the open in the sand, a scientist is going to process this snake. So unfortunately, um, we don't have $5,000 GPS tags that we could just put in the dorsal fin and let it go. Uh, snakes are not that small, and people don't care about snakes enough to give me a $5,000 transmitter. Um, so we do, we do some stuff the old-fashioned way. Um, we, we take down these measurements, and we release the snake. Um, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to measure that snake, um, we're going to weigh that snake, and we're going to tell if it's a boy or a girl, um, and we'll take some other measurements. What you can do is you can mark a snake by taking a scale clip of these belly scales, these ventral scales. And um, the ventral scales are made out of keratin, just like our fingernails. So they grow back. But when they grow back, they're discolored. And, uh, and then from that, you can, you can elucidate which snake it was. And so the only reason these are black is because I colored in um, where I cut the scale with Sharpie. And that allows you to, uh, the Sharpie wears away after just a couple days, but it allows you to quickly see which snake it is if you catch it again in a couple days. And so the way this allows you to tell which snake it is is because we start at a specific point where the tail starts and the body begins. So this is the tail of the snake and this is towards the head of the snake. And what you can do is you can actually count these scales, et cetera, et cetera. And then so this would be snake 17, 19, 23, 24. And so that's its unique barcode. Um, not as high tech as the uh, other really cool barcoding we saw. It's kind of a common, common theme, but uh, oh. And then this is an example of a snake that's been recaptured. So you can see the Sharpie has worn away, and we don't have a big gaping wound where we mutilated the snake like some people might think. Um, can you tell that this snake was recaptured? It's kind of hard to tell, but if you look here, there's this white patch. That's the scar where the scale was clipped. There's another scar, and there's another scar. So you can tell which snake you've captured um, it, in future years. I believe this, was, this, was, um, this snake was marked my first year, and we recaptured it the third year. And we were able to tell exactly which snake it was, how much it grew, get all sorts of really cool information that way. Alternatively, snakes uh, actually look unique, even though they appear similar. So you can notice, sure, they have superficial differences in the, in the, slight, in the color, right? But if you actually look at the scales on the head, these scales in particular, there's a unique pattern. And so if you line up two snakes and then superimpose their patterns, you can see that these are two distinct snakes. Look at that. This has a big circle here in the middle versus a little triangle. This has this hook right here. There's no hook here. Um, there's this weird little circle coming off where there's none here, right? So these are clearly two distinct snakes. And so that's a second way that we can confirm that I didn't screw up when I was counting which scales I was clipping. 
And then we can put radio transmitters in them, but they're much less high tech. Um, and to that, we actually had collaboration with folks at the Bronx Zoo who were fortunate enough to volunteer their time and expertise. And so what you actually do is you put the snake out because snakes are conscious, as we learned earlier, right? They can feel pain, they can sense things. Um, so because we want to minimize pain and suffering, we actually knock the snakes out with laughing gas, essentially. Um, and then you can actually put a transmitter inside the body cavity of a snake. How many people have seen a radio collar on a bear or a wolf on a, not on a documentary? Sure, plenty of us, right? Where do you put a radio collar on a snake? You can't do it. They also don't have a dorsal fin, so you can't uh, kind of attach it externally. So you're forced to put it inside their body cavity. Uh, it's an invasive surgery. However, uh, we had zero mortality associated with that, and that was very important to us. Um, so basically what happens is the transmitter just sits inside the snake, and um, there's an antenna that runs towards the head. And um, it works really, really well. And people have documented this in a lot of snakes, and it, and it affects them a teeny tiny little bit, but overall it's very safe, and, and the snakes resume their normal activities. What they used to do in the 50s and 60s was take one of these transmitters and sh literally shove it down the snake's throat and follow it until it pooped it out. So um, this is a much better technique. And then you can go out in the field and find that snake and learn all sorts of things about it because they're really hard to find otherwise. Um, this is another very short video showing why these transmitters are necessary if you really want to learn what these snakes are doing. So that beep indicates the, the location of the snake. A louder beep indicates you're closer to the snake. Definitely not over there. Probably in this tussock of grass. You can hear a killdeer in the background. All right, so where is it? It's not on that side of the tussock. It's not there. Still can't really see it. There it is. See that? That is why radio telemetry is super important when you're studying snakes, because how many people would have saw that tussock of grass, looked at this side, decided to look at this side, and that side, right? So radio telemetry is probably one of the best parts about being a wildlife biologist. All right, so knowing that's how we figure out home range, that so we could record every time we see that snake where it is. And um, so I'm just gonna give you an example of, uh, of a day or a kind of a, a snapshot of a season of one of these snakes we were, we were following. On May 1st, it was hanging out over here, tracked it May 2nd, it hadn't moved very far. May 6th, moved into some Phragmites wetlands. By May 10th, it was back under a bayberry bush. Obviously, this is a coastal snake, right? Uh, again, under some bayberry bushes, bayberry bushes, bayberry bushes, uh, in a patch of dry Phragmites. Uh, this time, it was actually out in the open, super hot on the sand in, 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 uh, on the 17th of June. But this was early in the morning, probably about 6 or 7 o'clock, if I remember correctly. And he made this super long trek. Um, which is about, you can't see it, I don't know why I didn't put a scale bar, but that's about 600 meters that it moved in a couple days over there, and it was hanging out under a little bush of uh, Asiatic bittersweet. And then, I couldn't find it from 24th of June to the 18th of August. The snake was gone, I could not find it, I thought a seagull ate it. I'm sorry, my ornithology teacher will be rolling in his grave right now. Uh, a gull ate it. Uh, but then I was looking for another snake and I found it all the way over here. Um, and I said, what are you doing over here? And then I couldn't find it, and it moved all the way back over there. Um, sometimes these snakes do really weird things. Um, now, what I understand now is that this was the breeding season, and I wonder if she moved really far to lay some eggs. I, I'm sorry, not the breeding season, but the nesting season. Then she hung out again in these Phragmites patches. Again in some Phragmites, Phragmites, and then she was right on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. That's the Atlantic Ocean right there. So they're hanging out in, in habitat that could be quite similar to piping plover. So are you guys familiar with the umbrella species concept, which is where one species has a large range 
and uh, is protected, and then that protects other species in itself. So that's one of the, one of the benefits of those piping plovers. Um, they protect a lot of other species that are living on this shore habitat. Um, so just amazing to get this beautiful snake right near the beach. Um, and there was actually some tourists just to the, to the right of this. Um, then she moved up from the beach, said, I don't, I don't like this anymore. And then again, moved all the way back to where I initially found her because these snakes kind of have uh, a circular pattern of, of movement throughout the season. But then she said, no, I want to go over here. She moved all the way back to where she was hanging out, went back down to the beach, and then finally crawled all the way up um, to some upland habitat and dug a nest for uh, 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 a den for the winter. So that's the second benefit of that upturned nose. Uh, a normal snake would have to crawl under some rocks, um, but a hogno snake can dig its own burrow. And so that snake wound up using about 37 hectares, which is about uh, 20 football fields, roughly, of size, um, which is kind of cool for a snake that's only this big, right? Whereas a box turtle might only spend its life in uh, an area the size of a, a single football field. Um, and so this graph just shows that it's easier to find these snakes in the spring and the fall. Um, and that is the orange bars. But then I thought, well, maybe I'm just looking harder or more frequently when I expect to find them, right? However, that's what the blue bar represents. The blue bar is snakes per survey. So I actually did a whole bunch of surveys in June, July, uh, starting in early August, a whole bunch of surveys, and I still didn't find a lot of snakes. Um, but then you see this disproportionate impact of October. If you want to find a hognose snake, go walk around in October. That's my best success, or my best advice for you. Um, and uh, so with some of these snakes, we had to wait for the veterinarian to have availability because he was busy doing important things like taking care of gorillas um, and other charismatic, awesome animals of the Bronx Zoo. So sometimes these snakes had to, had to wait um, to get their transmitters, but uh, yeah, and with that, thanks really much for listening. Appreciate it.